Welcome to the Three Down Nation podcast. I'm Justin Dunk, joined by John Hodge and J.C. Abbott. Today, we're discussing Jeshron Antwi going viral for executing an onside punt. Which teams could qualify for the last remaining playoff spot? Green Day being announced as the halftime show for this year's Grey Cup. Two UBC offensive linemen drawing interest from the NFL. BC adding Colin Kaepernick to their negotiation list. And our picks for week 18 in the CFL. But first. Saskatchewan Rough Riders legend George Reed passed away on Sunday, just one day before his 84th birthday. The native of Vicksburg, Mississippi, was a nine-time CFL All-Star and 10-time West Division All-Star during an outstanding 13-year playing career in green and white, during which he ran for 16,116 yards, which remained the league's all-time record for 30 years until it was broken by Mike Pringle. Reed retired at the peak of his game as he ran for 1,454 yards and 11 touchdowns in his final season in 1975, a time during which he also served as the president of the CFL Players Association. The Washington State University graduate was named the CFL's MOP in 1965 and helped Saskatchewan win its first great cup in 1966. How will you remember Mr. Reed? As a legend, Right. I mean, that's a word that gets thrown out a lot and pro- probably too much to be to be quite honest. But George Reed is in every sense of the word a legend. And while I know his sa- his passing has saddened football fans across the country, especially in the province of Saskatchewan, this is somebody, at least in my opinion, whose life we should just celebrate. Like we are so lucky that we got to have George Reed for as long as as we did. Obviously, on the field, I mean, Justin listed a bunch of the things that he accomplished. I mean, since his playing days, he's arguably just grown, right? Like he's he's got the Order of Canada. He moved back to Regina to spend his later years. He was a natural citizen or naturalized citizen of this country, a first ballot Hall of Famer. We all during Grey Cup last year, boys, saw the statue of George Reed they built outside of Mosaic Stadium. I mean, you don't get a statue built unless you are a true legend in every sense of the word. And I mean, George Reed, what he managed to accomplish. I mean, he, he was a man among boys during his career. And the fact that he was still rushing for darn near close to 1500 yards at the end of his career. And by the way, this was back before the CFL was playing 18 game seasons in the mid seventies. I think they were, they were only playing 16 games early in his career. I think they were playing 14 games. So he was putting up these numbers at a time when it was more difficult to put up these kinds of numbers and knowing how great he was. Like in in a tweet this week, I called George Reed one of the best players to ever play the game. And that was not a mistake on my part, not differentiating between the CFL and NFL, because I do believe that George Reed is one of the greatest to ever do it, regardless of either side of the border. He played during a time when players made the same amount of money in the NFL and CFL and the talent level was, was essentially on par. Nowadays, the very best players in the world are down South. And then the rest of them are pre- spread pretty evenly throughout the United States and Canada. In his day, that was not the case. The best players were everywhere. And one of them was in Regina for a 13 year career. Mr. Reed, rest in peace, rest in power. You will be much missed. He was an absolute workhouse, workhorse when he was on the field. I mean, you think about that record, that 16,000 yards, they all came coming right downhill, ragged to the teeth of the defense, right? There was was not a lot of dancing around going on with George Reed. He did it the hard way, and it was a record that held for 30 years. But to your point, Hodge, the stuff off the field, I never got the pleasure to meet the great George Reed. But by all accounts, this is someone who lived up to everyone's expectations off the field as well. A community involved person, somebody who was gracious to his fans, who stayed around the game and was a pleasure to meet. This is the type of athlete who did it the right way from start 
to finish in this outpouring of mourning and sorrow that happened after the announcement of his death is as much because of what he did once he retired and the way he comported himself and the way he stayed in that Regina community as it was about all the great things he did on the field. So we should celebrate Mr. Reed, but this week is a, is a sad week for Saskatchewan Rough Riders fans because they've lost one of their greatest icons and one of their greatest people as well. Last year at Grey Cup, I got the chance, fortunately, to go to the play called Simply 34. It was obviously all based on George Reed and his life and then his football career in Saskatchewan. Shout out my boy, Rash Madani, who brought me along with him. And the play just told you so much more about the man and the person that he was. I feel like so many times, and rightfully so, we focus on the football aspects and all his accolades on the field. But this man was a true gentleman. I think somebody that we can all look to to be better in our current society where social media likes and reposts and all these kinds of things seem to matter more than being polite and being a great person every day. I remember walking out of that theater at the Drake Hall at the University of Regina and seeing Mr. Reed and just the absolute celebrity that he was, but in such a quiet way, anybody that wanted a picture with him to talk to him, walk with him on the way out was what most of the crowd in attendance there decided to do because he's just that type of person. He never shied anybody or ushered anybody away. He always made time for everyone. And I think that's the unique thing that stands out to me about Mr. Reed is the fact that you hear about all of these stories around Saskatchewan and Regina, of course, but also our country of people talking about how great of a man he was. So I think that needs to be recognized. And I would challenge whether it's a Saskatchewan Rough Riders or the CFL to come up with an award that is in Mr. Reed's name. In U Sports or in Canadian University football, there's a great award named after Russ Jackson. He presents it every year at the Vanier Cup, and it's arguably just as, if not more, prestigious than the Heck Crichton Award. I think something along those lines is very apt for Mr. Reed. I think that's a great idea. The NFL has the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. I would love it, Grey Cup, to see somebody take home the George Reed Man of the Year Award in Hamilton. That would be fantastic. Canadian running back Jeshwin Antwi successfully executed an onside punt win on second and 18 from Montreal's 27-yard line. He caught a swing pass from Cody Fajardo and dropped the ball on his outstretched foot. The ball traveled one yard forward, and he recovered it, giving the Alouettes a first down. Was Montreal smart to exploit this little-known rule, or was this merely some lame trickery? Of course, it was a smart play by the Montreal Alouettes. There's no question about that whatsoever in my mind. But some of the reaction to this online has just been infuriating to me. I mean, the pearl clutching, the, oh, my God, we have to immediately change this rule. Guys, guys, this game has been around for over 100 years. If the onside punt hasn't become a problem to this stage, I don't think it's going to be, right? And people don't recognize this is the second time that Antwi has done this this year. Now, he didn't recover the first one. It was against the BC Lions. I witnessed it live. Everyone in the stadium was confused, but he dropped the ball on the ground and fumbled it, and BC tackled him for a loss. It's not exactly an easy play to execute. Brad Sinopoli attempted a similar move several years ago, which I believe was also unsuccessful, right? It's a difficult thing to pull off. When you do it, it's brilliant. It gets you a fresh set of downs, but it's not a play that is all suddenly going to alter the way defenses have to adapt on second and long, and it's going to be pulled out of the trick bag every single game from now on. It's not as if the Montreal Alouettes found a loophole that nobody knew existed. It's always been in the game. It will always be in the game. And they just happened to execute it perfectly at a good moment. Praise them for that. Let's forget about this pearl clutching and further Americanizing our game. Go and watch the NFL if you want to. This is a better game. Enjoy it for all its nuances. 
people who think that it would be easy in full game speed to pull this off need to go stand in front of somebody coming full speed downhill at them while they're trying to put a ball off their foot and also, by the way, recover it. So my only issue with this is the Alouettes kind of showing their hand here. I think this is something that you pull out in a situation where you're desperate for a play. Like this was a game that they won easily against Ottawa. Those Red Blacks did not show up at all. And I think you save it for down the line, potentially in the playoffs. It's very risky. I get it. But I think that's the part that people forget. They see it being successful, but it's not easy to do. So full credit to Antwi for actually pulling this off. I take umbrage with one thing you said, Dunk. You said this would be hard to do at full speed. Well, joke's on you. My full speed is still quite slow. (laughs) So that would be an advantage for me in this situation. Secondly, I will say this. With this play, yes, it gets you a fresh set of downs. But let's remember, the Alouettes were were second and 18 from their 27. The first down that Antwi got put them at the twenty eight. So is it better to be first and 28 or first and 10 at your 28 than it is second and 18 at your 27? Yes. But usually a first down is accompanied by traveling 10 or more yards down the field and getting you closer to a touchdown or field goal. That is not the case with this play. You merely get a new set of downs and you're lucky to get even one yard. So if this does change the way that defenses call their games, I think that'd be great. Because right now, defenses generally are going to put three, four high defenders on second and long and force teams to check it down underneath, which also drives fans crazy. Because then they go, man, why do we always throw for six yards on second and 18? The answer is because if you throw for 18, you're going to get picked. They, they, they have stacked the back of that defense up, packed it tight, unless you've got somebody who's capable of winning that jump ball 30, 40 yards down the field. That's going to end up in an interception almost every single time. So I would love it if defenses change the way that they defend second and long, but I don't think that's going to happen. This was a really cool thing that happened. I don't think it's going to happen every week. I certainly don't think it's even going to happen every month. This is going to be a once in a blue moon type situation and it'll catch people by surprise. And it'll be one of those things that the next time it happens, people go, Oh, who, who is that guy in Montreal again? Who did this thing? Oh, that was, that was really neat. And they'll, then they'll forget about it. I, I don't think this is a, a, a milestone game-breaking thing like some people are making it out to be. Montreal and Hamilton both punched their tickets to the playoffs this past week, leaving only one postseason spot available. Saskatchewan can clinch it with a win and a Calgary loss, while Ottawa and Edmonton can earn it by winning out if the Riders lose out. The Stampeders can also still get it if they win out, and the Rough Riders finish no better than one and two. Who is going to get the final playoff spot? You know, I really thought that the Stampeders would come out and actually play with some veracity, let's say, against the Hamilton Tiger Cats. They did not. I felt like if they won that game, they would have had a chance to get this final spot, considering they still have a game with Saskatchewan down the stretch here. And I think by virtue of the Elks and Stampeders just flat sucking and the Red Blacks as well, (laughs) that it's going to be the Rough Riders that get that spot. I agree with that. For the record, all three of these teams have three games to go. The Riders at six wins have Hamilton, Calgary, Toronto. Not bad considering that the Argos will presumably be resting people in the final week of the regular season. Calgary's got Saskatchewan, BC, and Winnipeg. They're currently on a bye. And then Edmonton and Ottawa, who are the ultimate long shots, they've got to win out. Edmonton's got Toronto, Montreal, Winnipeg. Ottawa's got Montreal, Toronto, Toronto. The really bad news for Edmonton, who actually, of these four teams, I would be most excited to see in the playoffs. Nobody, and I repeat, nobody in this league wants to play against Trey Ford in the playoffs because he is going to come in and steal that game from you and run for 120 yards. But I do not see a realistic path for the Elks to get into the postseason, uh, they, they, they've simply dug themselves in too deep of a hole. The Red Blacks, I think, same thing. They've got Montreal, Toronto, Toronto. If they couldn't get up for last week's game, how are they going to get up for this week's game when their playoff chances are all the smaller? I will also, for the fact that they're currently two wins ahead of everybody else on this list, take the Riders. 
Yeah, it's the Riders. It's not even a question, guys. Like, it's just the Riders, and that's a sad reality because I don't think any of these teams are particularly that good. If it was all on even footing, I would say Edmonton because I think they're the hottest of the bunch. But unfortunately, the way their schedule breaks, they're not going to get a realistic chance at this because they have so many buys down the stretch at the end of the season and they play all their consecutive games to start the year, which were all, all losses, if we all remember. Saskatchewan has the better matchups. I think they have the better team, and they've currently got the league on this playoff spot. I don't think there's much debate here. I simply don't see it from the Stampeders. They look like a team that has utterly collapsed, and Ottawa and Edmonton are just too far behind for me to consider them realistic. So congratulations, Ragger Nation. You get it by default. But, 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 just imagine, imagine for one second, with all that taken into consideration, imagine that a different team makes the playoffs. I'm not saying I don't want the Riders to make the playoffs because Lord knows it'd be good for the CFL if Saskatchewan got back in the playoffs this year. It helped boost the ratings, it helped boost the, in- boost the intrigue, all that stuff. Imagine they did make it with the current advantage they have. That would be wild. Guys, I actually think it's possible that the Elks get in there. And JC, I'll debate you on this a little bit. I actually think the better team right now is Edmonton compared to Saskatchewan. The problem is... I agree. I agree as well. Start, they're hard. Right? Yeah. yeah. I think we do all agree across the board. And that's what I meant by Edmonton sucking is that awful start. If they would have started Trey Ford earlier, if Chris Jones' defense wouldn't have gave up so many points in those games that Ford began to start in, the couple losses that they had, then I think Edmonton could be in there. It's possible, guys. Saskatchewan just has no energy that the Rough Riders lose out and the Elks win out. I understand the schedules being what they are. That's certainly a possibility. So I think to Hodge's point, we need to maybe open up our minds some more because the Rough Riders have not played inspiring football at all. They've played the complete opposite, whatever that word is. And they're a team that I would think anybody that's going to make the postseason would put their hand up to face because you feel like you at least have the chance to get an easy victory. So I think the Rough Riders are in the driver's seat, but the Elks have a decent shot and Saskatchewan has to find a way to win here at some point. And, Toronto ain't going to be easy, as the Winnipeg Blue Bombers learned last week. One thing before we move on. I will just say this. Every year in the middle of the summer, some clod hopper has to say the worst cliche in CFL history, which is, well, the CFL season doesn't even start until Labor Day. (laughs) And it's no. The Elks have won four of their last six games, and they're going to be sitting at home in November because they sucked. All summer long. The CFL season does not start on Labor Day. It starts in June. And if you sleep in through the first three months of the season, you're going to suck and be at home, even (laughs) though you should have been in the playoffs. So the CFL season starts in week one. Quit it with the Labor Day nonsense. Malarkey. Quit it. If JC was the CFL season... He would not start until Labor Day. I'm oh, sure. that is true. Ouch. <laughs> that is ouch. true. You have anything to say for yourself, young man, or you want me to move on? Uh, hey, all I'll say is I make a great playoff push at the end of the day. That's, that's what I do. Okay. I respect the effort. Green Day has been named the performer for this year's 110th Grey Cup halftime show in Hamilton. The announcement seems to have been very popular on social media and is certainly an improvement over last year's act, which featured half of the members of Georgia, Florida line. That was such an odd choice. What do you make of this one, Hodge? I think it's great. You know, I think people are right. I mean, our own guy, Ryan Ballantyne, wrote a great opinion column on this. And generally, I mean, this is anecdotal, of course, but across social media, this seems to be as positively received as I've ever seen a Grey Cup halftime show. I know some people are a little bit upset that it's an American act. And look, I I think it would be a problem if the CFL just said, we're abandoning all Canadian acts, we're only ever going to have Americans. But that is not what the CFL is doing or has done. They simply have booked one of the biggest punk pop rock bands in the history of music. And I grew up a big fan of Green Day. I think Warning was my like second CD I ever owned back when we, we cared about CDs. 
I, I don't admittedly listen to Green Day on a regular basis, but I like it when their music comes on. Sadly, it's on the oldies stations or podcast networks or streaming networks now. But I do still enjoy Green Day, and uh, I think they're going to put on a great show. And if if they were having Green Day play the, the, the Great Cup halftime show in 2035 or 2040, I think that would be a concern. But I think that this group is still relevant enough in 2023 that this is a big deal, not just for the CFL and the Grey Cup to elevate the kind of spectrum of this event, but I think it's big enough to potentially even garner some international headlines because mm-hmm. Green Day is a well-known international act. Yeah. As a 26-year-old, I can say this is not a band that is past my generation, right? It's certainly older than me in its heyday, but it was still a recognizable name for somebody who is not all that clued in to the popular music scene like myself. It was still a band that I was aware of going through school that my friends listened to and that we sang along to. So I don't think this is a case of of an older band that is just completely irrelevant to the fans that the CFL is trying to attract. They've hit that sort of sweet spot where it most appeals to sort of the late 20s to late 30s demographic. The younger kids can be brought along by their parents. I thought it was an excellent move overall by the CFL to make this. And the added plus is that they will sing the anthem, which I think best represents my thoughts whenever someone criticizes the onside punt, American Idiot. (laughs) That's pretty good. Can we get just a couple things straight here okay green day is a big act it is a great get for the cfl but jamie and i said on the green zone when i was on there the other day that green day is one of the biggest music acts of all time now i admittedly am terrible with pop culture i think that's widely known at this point i grew up on a farm with a transistor radio we only got a handful of channels and i had to like turn the little dial just so I could listen to the fan 590 all the time. That's a sports talk radio station for the uninitiated, but like all time we're talking all time, like up there with like Elvis Presley, Jay Z. Yes. I'm on Google right now. Bob Dylan, (laughs) Tom Petty. Like what are we talking about here? Garth Brooks. I'm just impressed you didn't call him Jay Z. Jay Z. Yeah. In Canada, we should call him Jay Z. I don't want to get in trouble from our American listeners, but Jay-Z, Jay-Z, whatever it is. Like, I think you get my point. Bruce Springsteen, like, Green Day is a great get, but they are by no means talked about as one of the greatest musical acts of all time. Period. I'm done. I'm I'm sorry. Are you suggesting that the CFL should have hired Bob Dylan for the halftime show? Is he even still alive? No, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying when (laughs) people talk about this in a silly way and say dumb things on air, like Nye said, he needs to be corrected, that's all. How many Grammys you got, Dunk? Zero. Okay. (laughs) I admit it, my pop culture knowledge is atrocious. Five five less than Green Day, then. (laughs) For the record, first of all, let's, 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 uh, let, let, let's let's give the Bob Dylan fans some time here. Yes, Bob Dylan is still alive, and oh, he is okay, eighty-two. Um, that said, I don't like Bob Dylan's music at all. I think he's a great Ooh. songwriter and a terrible singer. Um, wow. However, Green Day for the. I don't think it's a hot take that Bob Dylan is not a good singer, but that's okay. For the record, on this list published by Loudwire of the top twenty-five best-selling. It's called Hard Rock and Metal Artists of All Time. Queen, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, ACDC, Metallica, Bon Jovi are the top six. Green Day is listed at 14. And I think that Green Day is disadvantaged on this list because their biggest record, I mean, Dookie in 1994 was a huge record, but their biggest record was American Idiot. It came out in 2004, which was like the peak lime wire illegal downloading era so people were not <laughs> buying music the same way that they were back in the 70s now that is if you want to try to make this argument about records sold right if, if greatest means sold the most records that's one thing greatest could also mean a more subjective 
way of just like, this is the music I like the most. Personally, again, I took a lot of my way to listen to the pop punk music of the 2000s, but there is something inherently nostalgic about it for me because it didn't matter what kind of music you were into. It just surrounded, right? Whether it was Green Day, Sum 41, Blake 182, whatever. That was just the music of my youth. So I like this. Would I call Green Day one of the best musical acts of all time? No, because then you're including like literally all of music history. And I don't want to compare Wagner to Green Day. But if you're talking about artists that were influential in the late 90s, 2000s, or you want to talk about punk rock bands, absolutely Green Day is on that list. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers will visit the BC Lions for what is clearly the game of the week and possibly the game of the year. The teams currently have tied the season series at one game apiece, meaning this contest will decide it. They've got matching 11 and four records, of course. The winner will not yet have clinched first place in the West Division, though they would have to lose out while the other team wins out in order to fall back to second place. What are your expectations for this game? I think it's going to be a hotly contested affair. The t- previous two games between these two teams, BC ran away with the first one. Winnipeg came back in the second one and blew them out. I think this is going to be a much closer game, a more even game. Both sides are prepared and they know the stakes. It's really a pick 'em, right? It's it's a it's a tough matchup, but the bigger thing for me is this is not only going to decide the West Division and who gets a first round playoff by. In my mind, this game decides the MOP race because you have Zach Caleros and Vernon Adams Jr. facing off against each other in a pivotal primetime matchup. And those are the two guys, with all due respect to Chad Kelly, who I think are in legitimate contention for the award right now. And as we all know, digging back to midseason, I've been pounding the table for Vernon Adams Jr., and I think I've been proven right. I published an opinion piece earlier today. You can check it out on 3downnation.com laying out the case for Vernon Adams to be the MOP. And I think numbers-wise, specifically in terms of his passing yardage and how consistent he's been at reaching over the 300-yard mark on an offense in which a lot of the pressure has been placed on him as opposed to Winnipeg, which has such a potent running game, he has done everything that the Lions have asked of him and much more. So if he has another strong game against the Bombers, not even just win it, but have a strong game, put up numbers, don't make the key mistakes. In my mind, Vernon Adams Jr. can secure the MOP vote with this performance. If the award was called the CFL MVP, then I think it would be Chad Kelly's running away, but it is MOP, most outstanding player. So I somewhat agree with my colleague JC here that Zach Kolaris and Vernon Adams Jr. should be in the conversation. And honestly, some fans made me open up to the idea of Brady Oliveira being in that conversation after I did a Sportsnet video segment on him being the runaway favorite to be the most outstanding Canadian this year. I think Oliveira has arguably been the most consistent playmaker for the Blue Bombers this year, and it has racked up a ton of yardage on the ground. And this guy is usually the finisher for this team when they have other teams on the ropes. He runs downhill and knocks them out. So I think those are the guys that are legitimately in the conversation. This game will go a long way towards deciding it. But I also feel like what happens here, guys, is that some of the media gets fatigued with people like Calaris in this situation, because he's the two-time reigning MOP. Calaris has thrown 30 touchdowns yet again, and I think you take him away from this team, and Brady Oliveira doesn't rush for 1,000 yards as easily as he's done it. And we saw what the Bombers looked like before Calaris showed up there and led them to being in three straight Grey Cups, winning two of those in 2019 and 2021. So I don't want that fatigue to set in with Kolaris. I will let his play do the talking in this year to ultimately decide who gets my vote. 
Well, if there's one thing that the media likes, and we agree, I am in full agreement that the media does experience fatigue, but if there's one thing they like, it's a sexy story. And as much as the CFL schedule makers ruined the Grey Cup rematch last <laughs> week, they deserve all the credit in the world for nailing this chef's kiss. BC Lions, Winnipeg Blue Bombers in Vancouver, third last game of the season. This is perfect timing for this matchup. The winner, again, will not have clinched first place, but they're going to be darn close. And I will say, as much as four, six weeks ago, I thought JC's opinion of VA being the MOP was not lunacy, but also not terribly appropriate. I do think that Vernon <laughs> Adams Jr. has played well enough as of late, while simultaneously Zach Kolaris has had some troubles, that it is a very legitimate race. The one thing I will say is I wish we lived in a world where the two finalists for MOP didn't have to be from different divisions because we all know who the East Division MOP candidate is going to be. That's going to be Chad Kelly. I think Chad Kelly is going to lose that at the league level because he sat so much lately and his numbers are not as impressive as what we've seen from Zach Kolaris and Vernon Adams Jr. And I would love to even have three people, regardless of division, be finalists for this award. It would certainly make awards night more interesting if the final ballot was Adams, Kolaris, Oliveira or Adams, Kolaris, Kelly, right? I know I would be more excited to go to the CFL awards night, which is in Niagara Falls this year. Mind you, that's good enough reason to go anyway, or to tune in on TSN, right? The divisional model is completely outdated. We should have three finalists for each award and that should be irrespective of, of division. Another perfect example, you talked about Dunk Brady Oliveira being the runaway candidate for MOC. I agree with that, but I think the second best Canadian in the CFL has been Nick Dembski. And Nick Dembski isn't even going to get a team nomination because that's going to go to Brady Oliveira. I think the MOC ballot at the end of the year should be Matthew Betts, Brady Oliveira, and Nick Dembski. And all three of those are not, of course, going to be able to be on the ballot. They're all in the West Division. So to me, when we talk about awards, that is my issue. It should be a longer ballot, no divisions. As for this game, I'll reveal my pick shortly. Tease. <laughs> yep. The University of British Columbia has two NFL caliber offensive linemen in Theo Benedict and Giovanni Manu. Do you believe one or both young men can earn an NFL shot, Dunk? I do believe it is possible NFL scouts have been traveling to that beautiful campus on the West Coast to check these guys out. We're talking about big dudes. Benedette is all of six foot seven, over 300 pounds. Manu, six foot eight, around 350 pounds. The dude can not only dunk a basketball, he played basketball coming up before he got to university, but he can do the splits. Called him. Man, like I'm a tiny little wiener. I can't even get close to doing the splits. And this guy's 6'8", 350, blocking these physical dudes on the defensive side of the ball. And he can do the splits. Like, these guys are super athletic. There have already been a number of NFL teams up there to check these guys out live and in person. And for people who maybe don't know the importance of that, let's go back to Laurent Duvernay-Tardif, who had NFL teams coming to McGill University during his final season there to check him out. The Bears, Steelers, Chargers, Seahawks, and Eagles have already visited UBC. The Carolina Panthers are going to be at a Thunderbirds home game in October. And Blake Neal, the head coach, and Steven Simbone, the offensive coordinator, have already talked to over a double-digit amount of NFL teams about these two guys. Shamari Williams, the former number one CFL draft pick, has been helping these NFL scouts navigate that city and getting in there for the first time if it indeed is their first time going there so these guys are legit and it's just another reason why people need to pay attention to Canadian University football these guys are ultra talented and oh by the way they were involved in I think for my money and I'm a little biased because I was on the call but the best Canadian football game that was played last week at Griffith Stadium, 34-31, back and forth affair. Lots of fireworks in that one. People need to start understanding and appreciating these athletes north of the border. First of all, I want to just 
take a moment to recognize the greatest thing that's ever been said on this podcast when Justin Dung said, and I believe this is an exact quote, I'm a little wiener. I will be clipping that. <laughs> I will be clipping that video. I will be clipping that audio. And I will probably be turning it into a GIF so I can use it on social media. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, as some more background on these two fantastic offensive linemen, both attended the East West Bowl in 2023. And both are legitimately that big. U sports teams are well known for exaggerating the size of their athletes. All college teams, both secondary teams do this to some extent. Some U sports programs are worse than others. Both genuinely measured in at six foot seven. Manu jumped 32 and a half inches in the vert at 357 pounds, which is insane. While Benedict leapt a nine foot five inch broad jump which for an offensive lineman is really good, even by NFL combine standards. So these are two freak athletes. Benedict is personally my favorite of the two. He played defensive line and tight end in high school at 230 pounds, got an offer to Tulsa as a tight end and decided to instead stay near home at UBC and build his frame. He started at again, 250 pounds at UBC, grew to what he is now, which is close to 300. I think Benedict could be the next Carter O'Donnell, a youth sports guy who goes mm. down and sticks. Manu, again, I like, and he has more NFL size. I just think Benedict moves better for, for my liking, but both are absolutely worthy of NFL consideration. And it would be great after the retirement of Laurent Duvernay Tardif if we could replace him with not one, but two Canadian U Sports offensive lineman down south. Well, it's it's provable how well Benedet moves because he's played this process extremely well, him and his agent, and he went down to the East West Shrine Bowl, which is different than the event you were talking about, uh, Hodge. This is the college football all star game down in the States in Las Vegas, Nevada now, which invites usually one or two Canadian university prospects down per year. Well, Benedict went a year early because he could, he didn't have to declare for the NFL draft until later in that process. So he pulled himself out of the draft to gain some interest, but got in front of NFL scouts and got to show himself against elite uh, NCAA competition. And he looked fantastic in that game but also going through all the testing in practice. They did some advanced sports science on these guys, and Theo Benedict was named the most balanced offensive lineman in attendance. He was in the 75th percentile or higher in all of their pass set movement metrics going both directions. So he is physically, from a movement standpoint, a freak, and at the top, even when compared against elite NCAA Division I offensive linemen, he moves better than all of them. So this is a guy who is, I think, going to get drafted for sure. Manu, he's got potentially even a higher ceiling based on his frame. And you mentioned his basketball accolades there, Dunk. Well, back in his days at Pitt Meadow Secondary, Show, uh, Secondary School, he had a nickname. Do you know what the nickname was, Dunk? Ooh, I don't. Baby Shaq. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And he he was a star on the BC High School basketball circuit that Pitt Meadows team made some noise in the playoffs because here was this 6'8", and he was just about 350 pounds in high school as well, kid. Duncan under the basket with the nickname Baby Shaq. He has only gotten better from there. I think he moves less well than Benedict but he is still a freak considering he is 50 pounds heavier. Both of these guys have extremely bright futures south of the border. The Blue Bombers are rogue underdogs against the BC Lions this week in a game that will decide the season series between the two teams and essentially decide first place in the West Division. Winnipeg beat the depleted Toronto Argonauts in comeback fashion last week while the Lions have won four straight games. Who do you have in this matchup of West Division contenders? I'm taking BC this week. And I'm taking BC this week because I think that home field advantage, Jordan Maximic and all of those fantastic receivers the Lions have, have an advantage 
on that track field surface. And I think that the the Winnipeg Blue Bombers secondary, which has struggled at times this year, is really going to miss Demario Houston. Looks like he's not going to play this week. So I am taking BC, which I think is really bad news for the Bombers because if they do, in fact, lose this game, if the West Final is in Vancouver, I think that the Lions are going to win that game as well. I think the Bombers win the West Final if it's in Winnipeg and they can get Brady Oliveira going in the cold. But out West, I like BC's chances. I'm taking the Lions. Yeah, I, I've i gone back and forth on this matchup a ton. And I keep trying to convince myself one way or the other. The way I look at this, the Lions have had some inconsistency in the last few weeks. Some slow starts or some difficulty finishing. The Bombers have shown that they bounce back extremely well from uncharacteristic performances. And I think last week against Toronto, they expected to blow out the Argos with a backup quarterback, and they got humbled a little bit. And the last thing you want to do is face the Bombers when they've been humbled. So they're coming out. I think Winnipeg's going to be firing on all cylinders. BC may be a little bit cocky. They may not be entirely prepared. I think the Blue Bombers will squeak out a win in this one, even though I think Vernon Adams Jr. is the better quarterback. That's debatable. But Mike O'Shea will have his team focused here. I totally agree with JC's point there that last week losing to the Argonauts while Chad Kelly was pinned to the bench is going to be something that he's going to be using for motivation for this team. And until I see Vernon Adams do it, and beat a big-time team in a big-time game and doesn't make a mistake, then I'm going to go with the Bombers. The first part of that doubleheader, the Edmonton Elks visit the Toronto Argonauts on Friday in a game that currently has no betting line, but you can find it at 3 downnationcom And, of course, if you choose to bet through us, make sure you do it responsibly. And the reason, presumably, that there is no line yet is because the Argos have not named a starting quarterback. Who do you think will take this one and where would you put the line? I would put this line at Toronto Argonauts minus four. And the reason for that is generally home teams get three points anyway. I think the Argos deserve a little more than that, but I wouldn't go as high as a touchdown. If this was as high as a touchdown, I would happily be taking the Edmonton Elk simply because we know the Argos are going to be resting guys. Now, I've heard from some sources that it appears as though Chad Kelly is more likely to play the home games, which can help, of course, Toronto's gate, help the interest in the games, and maybe he will rest for the away games, as we saw with the Toronto Argonauts when they came to Winnipeg and almost won this past week at IG Field. So I will take the Argos to win this game because I still think their depth is fantastic, but I do think it will be a close game as the Elks look to keep their faint playoff hopes alive. The Elks just have more to play for here. And so I'm taking them because they've got a guy who plays as hard as anybody in the league when he has that opportunity in Trey Ford. I think they're going to come out of this game with a purpose while the Argos are going to go through the motions as we've seen in the past. And really, I think Edmonton should be favored. I take them up and up until a, a four point favorite in this game because I feel that strongly about Trey Ford versus this particular version of the Argos. Edmonton knows they got to have this game to keep their postseason chances alive. They're coming off a bye week, so I like Trey Ford in Edmonton to get it done. But that said, it's not going to be easy no matter who is out there in double blue for the Argonauts. I think they've shown, especially last week in Winnipeg that even if they don't have their full complement of starters, that they can still be a very competitive team. So I'll take the Elks, but it ain't going to be easy. The Rough Riders are four-point home favorites over the Hamilton Tiger Cats on Saturday in what will surely be an emotional game in Regina as the team mourns the loss of George Reed and celebrates the 2013 Grey Cup champions as they enter the Plaza of Honor. Can Saskatchewan shake a four-game losing streak and move one step closer to punching their ticket to the playoffs? Look, I think the Hamilton Tiger Cats are clearly the better of these two football teams. But if you are the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and you have to walk into a game the week of George Reed's death and you do not come out with a win, you're not going to be back next year. There's no escaping that. 
There is no coming back from that. And I think the wig of that will be on this organization and they have to rise to that occasion. So for that reason, I'm going to pick the Saskatchewan Rough Riders to win and cover this game. They should come out with an emotional response just as number 34 deserves. The Tiger Cats are playing way better ball right now. They still could have a shot, I think, to host a home playoff game. Is that right? They do have a shot, yes. There we go. So lots to play for. I actually think this team, at this point in time, all due respect to Bo Levi Mitchell, is better off with either Matthew Schilt or Taylor Powell at quarterback. I like the Tiger Cats to get it done, take them on the money line. Great value with the Tabbies. If the Saskatchewan Rough Riders don't win this game, I don't think they'll win another game this year. They this this table has been set. The emotion should carry this team through just as it did against the Hamilton Tiger Cats in the 2013 Grey Cup. For that reason and that reason alone, I have to take the Riders to win and cover here. If they can't do it now, they will never do it simply. The Ottawa Red Blacks are six and a half point underdogs in Montreal this week as they will look to avoid elimination from the playoffs with a win. Meanwhile, the Alouettes can clinch second place in the standings with a victory paired with a Hamilton loss. These teams met last week with Montreal winning easily by a score of 32 to 15. Who you got? There is no way, again, I'm going to trust this Ottawa team after last week. I thought it would be a spirited effort that was awful. Red Blacks need to be better. I'm picking Montreal. I am taking the Montreal Alouettes as well because of just how uninspired the Ottawa Red Blacks look. Dustin Crum, JC and I sang his praises last week on this show, and then he went and played literally the worst game of his career. That pick six was awful. That is like obvious man coverage, and you throw the latest out route known to man working against arguably the fastest defensive back in the league. Nightmare situation for that team. The Alouettes with the win paired with the Ticats loss will clinch a home playoff game for the second straight year. Obviously, the Alouettes will know the result of the Saskatchewan-Hamilton game. By this point, I'm taking the Alouettes. They say the diff- definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and expecting a different result. Well, lock me up in the loony bin because <laughs> I am picking the Ottawa Red Blacks for a second straight week. And simply it's because I think it's too difficult to sweep a four-game season series in a league like the CFL. I think inevitably the underdog has to come out with one. The Red Blacks need a bounce-back performance. I think they get one here. It's now time for Hodge's Heritage Moment. On this day in 2019, Chris Flynn's number one was retired by the St. Mary's Huskies. The native of Buckingham, Quebec, led his team to a 27-2 and regular season record over four years under center from 1987 to 1999, along with two appearances in the Vanier Cup. Flynn remains the only player in U Sports history to win the Heck Crichton Trophy in three consecutive seasons and remains its all-time leader in touchdown passes with 87. He was inducted into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame in 2011. Dunk, you're a former U Sports quarterback. What do you know? JC, you are a passionate supporter of U Sports. What do you remember of, Cl- of Chris Flynn? Well, he's simply the GOAT, right? This is a guy who did it all at the U Sports level for a smaller school program like the St. Mary's Huskies and was deservingly a member of the Canadian Football Hall of Fame for all he accomplished at the amateur level. For me, the greatest tragedy is that he never got a legitimate CFL shot, right? He had to go to the World League of Football and play for the Montreal machine to try and achieve his professional dream that's a real tragedy because chris flynn was one of the best to ever pull on a u sports uniform he really was he was a tremendously special player and i wish uh, i i wish i was old enough to have have lived through that era of u sports especially out east which i know that conference has had its issues the last few years with maybe declining play though admittedly the santa fx x-men did very well in the playoffs last year all things considered 
Um, Chris Flynn, one of the best to ever do it. Uh, in my, for my money, the best U sports player of all time, probably ahead only of Andy Fantuz and probably Jesse Lumsden will be right there with them. Three minute drill. The city of Toronto is flying the Argonauts flag at City Hall on Wednesday in honor of the team's 150-year anniversary. Is that a show of respect? I think it is. And the city of Toronto and the Toronto Argonauts are indelibly entwined because how long this team has been around, right? There is no North American sports team that boasts as rich a history as the Toronto Argonauts. It's right for the city to honor them on their anniversary. Obi Khan beat Willard Reeves in Tuesday's Manitoba election in a head-to-head battle of former Blue Bombers. Was that a surprise, Hodge? Not really. Um, For the uninitiated, Willard Reeves runs for the Manitoba Liberal Party. The Liberal Party had only three of 57 seats going into yesterday's election, and they won one of them back. He did give Khan a run for his money, but the Fort White district in which they're running in southwest Winnipeg has been PC since it was created in 1999. So Khan running for the progressive conservatives was certainly the favorite there, and he won. JC, you reported that the BC Lions have had no contact with Colin Kaepernick, and the team isn't looking to add a quarterback at this time. Do you think there's any chance, even though the team added him, of course, to their neg list, that we will see him in the CFL? No. I don't think there's any chance that Colin Kaepernick, after that many years away from football, undermines his point for $90,000 and comes up to the CFL. He's out of football. This is passe. In my opinion, this is simply a marketing move from the BC Lions. They take a spot on their neg list. They throw a name on there that they can remove in a month. They leak it to the media, and everyone starts talking about the organization. He's never, ever coming to Vancouver. Blue Bombers receiver Nick Dembski needs only 37 yards to reach 1,000 for the first time in his career. If he's able to do so, he and teammate Grady Oliveira will be the first Canadian teammates in CFL history to rush and receive for 1,000 yards in the same season. How cool is that? First of all, it's ridiculous that a Canadian football league team has never had a Canadian rush and another Canadian receive for a thousand yards in the same season. It's about time that it's happened. Secondly, the fact that it's happened with not one, but two players who are from the same city in which their team is located, I think adds to this. Plus there's also the ridiculous fact that Dembski and Oliveira, though attending the school at different times are both graduates of, of Oak Park High School. So not only the first two Canadians, but the first two to do it in their hometown and the first two to do it as people who graduated, alumni of the same high school. Amazing. JC, you published a top 10 mid-season watch list for the Heck Crichton Trophy, which is awarded annually to the top football player in U sports. Who made your number one spot and why? It's Taylor L. Gersma from the... Wilfred Laurier University Golden Hawks. He wasn't on my radar, truly, to begin the season. Didn't put up great numbers last year, but has exploded onto the scene as a third year, as so many great quarterbacks do. He's six foot six. He's throwing the ball all over the park with great numbers. To me, he is just an inch above the other two quarterbacks in U sports right now with those impressive no- numbers and Garrett R- Rooker at UBC and Evan Hillock at Western, but El Gersma has less around him and he is still undefeated. Campbell fair hit a 55 yard game winning field goal to lift the Ottawa GGs to an 18 to 16 win over the Carlton Ravens in the 54th annual Panda game. How exciting was that finish? Oh, it was amazing. Right, You had Carlton fans trying to storm the field when there was still a tiny bit of time left on the clock for Fair to hit this field goal. By the way, Fair, a sixth-round pick of the Calgary Stampeders in the 2023 CFL draft. With a leg like that, you wonder if he could, in fact, be the heir apparent to Rene Paradis, who's expected to retire after this season. Darian Durant is returning to Regina for the 2013 Grey Cup celebration in Saskatchewan this weekend and will attend a Riders game for the first time since he retired. Do you think that he'll get a warm reception? 
I think he will. This is a quarterback that brought the team a great cup, right? And there haven't been that many in Rough Rider history. I know there's been some rocky moments in the intervening years, but all that gets swept under the rug once you've retired and you make your return. They are going to honor him just as they would all of their greats. Janarian Grant appears to be returning to the lineup for Winnipeg this week after missing 10 games with an ankle injury. Is that a boost for the Bombers' return game? It's a huge boost. The Bombers had what was arguably the best, certainly the second best, return game in the CFL through the first five weeks. After Janarian Grant went down, they have had the worst return game in the CFL, which has hurt their field position, limited their big plays, Janarian Grant being back. I mean, heck, if you watch his media availability from Tuesday when he returned to practice, he likened himself to a lion with his foot ready to go and attack in the turf. This looks like a guy who is fearless, who is fired up, and is extremely motivated to help his team get this all-important win in Vancouver I can't wait for what we see Jerry Grant do on the field. Last one, Troy Aikman and Aaron Rodgers compared the high-scoring Miami Dolphins offensive offensive scheme to that of a CFL team. Do you think that's a legit comparison? I think it is. With all their pre-snap motion, it almost looks like the waggle, except they're not allowed to go forward. The funniest thing to me about this is going into the playoffs last year, the Miami Dolphins were – practicing and they noticed some people in the stands so they threw a 12th person in our offense to confuse any onlookers and ensure that their plays weren't being recorded so in fact the Miami Dolphins have run a CFL offense in the recent past and they continue to do so with some of their schemes I think it's just a testament to how explosive the CFL game can be offensively one of the best NFL offenses is playing copycat We thank you, as always, for listening to the Three Down Nation podcast. We will see you next Wednesday for our next episode.